Hey, everybody. Today, we're debating the resurrection, and we are starting right now with Steve's opening statement. Thanks for being with us, Steve. The floor is all yours. All right. Well, thanks for having me, and thanks for uh, to my opponent, Mark, for uh, agreeing to be part of this, too. Uh, by the way, this uh, we first discussed this about a week or so ago, where uh, there's been some changes, both in who I would be debating and what subject, but we decided we're going to be talking about did Jesus rise from the dead? That's the proposition. And my, my position is the, the affirmative. So uh, that's why I'm going first to tell you what it is I do believe. And I, what I do believe is the Christian doctrine that Jesus, uh, after he died and was buried, came back to life again and was seen uh, by uh, a number of people prior to his ascension into heaven. This is, of course, what Christians have always claimed. And in fact, it is not an esoteric claim. It's basically a, a claim about an allegedly historical fact. So it can be investigated as any alleged historical fact can be. If we were talking about something esoteric, something um, uh, something that was untestable, uh, I don't know that I'd even be interested in debating the point. But I am interested in at least presenting the reasons for believing that this historically happened. Now, I see the discussion of the resurrection of Jesus and the debate about it as a debate about the origins of Christianity and explain certain things that are here now, things that really exist, Christianity being one of them. Christianity is a world religion. There are others. Um, approximately a third of the world's population profess to believe in Christianity. That doesn't make it true. In fact, it could be as false as the other religions, I believe, are. But uh, the thing is, it exists. And the, we, when we ask, okay, why are there you know, uh, two and a half billion people or more who think something is true, uh, we actually have to say we have to trace that back to something, have to trace it back to some origins. And the Christian view is that it originated with Jesus uh, coming to earth, living, dying, and rising again, and with his followers uh, declaring those things to be true and successfully convincing uh, very many people that it was true somehow. And so the resurrection of Jesus really it doesn't just hang in midair. It's, it's part of an explanation of the origin of something like the religion of Christianity. And there's other things that have whose origin uh, should be explained as well. I mean, these are things that don't prove Christianity to be true, but they are things that exist and which the resurrection of Jesus provides one explanation of why they exist. Now, my opponent will no doubt provide alternative explanations of why they exist, and that's exactly why a debate is needed, because there is more than one possible explanation. I'm going to suggest that the one uh, that Christians have given is very adequate and that no other explanation is. Uh, what are the other things of any other case where universal historical testimony all is lies? Uh, we can be open to that. But we have to explain why there is this testimony. In other words, what's the origin of this testimony? I would say the resurrection of Christ was the origin of it. Uh, another thing that we have to explain is there's a report that no one has ever denied, that is, that is no historical scholar has ever denied, that when Jesus was buried, it was not long after that that his tomb was found empty. This fact, uh, and it's empty to this day, no one has ever found a body in any tomb that was to be identified with Jesus. In fact, within days after his death, nobody could find a body in the tomb even though the location of the tomb was known and visited by people afterwards. Uh, the fact that the tomb is empty, I think, requires some kind of explanation, and I think the resurrection of Christ uh, fits the pattern best. A fourth thing is that there are multiple written documents. I'm thinking of the, the Gospels and uh, some of the epistles in the New Testament that claim that witnesses saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. Not They didn't see it happen. They saw him afterward that they had um, interaction with him. They touched him. They ate with him. Uh, they conversed with him. And that these uh, written documents and these traditions stem from essentially, roughly, uh, contemporary with the events they're talking about. So the fact that there are these things means we, you know, one or another explanation should be provided. It is my view that the resurrection of Christ is the best explanation for those things. Um, there are also many credible um, traditions, ancient traditions, 
about who those witnesses were who wrote the, the Gospels, uh, about their lives, and about their deaths. And those reports, uh, there's never been any evidence against those reports, and they're fairly universally held among those in the early stages of the development of Christianity. Uh, those traditions could be false, so obviously any traditions could be, but they exist and need to be explained. Why do they exist? Why would such traditions arise if they weren't true? Explanation. But to me, the best explanation for them is they are true, and that it's because Jesus did rise from the dead. Um, I'd also point out that there exists no evidence of the unreliability of these witnesses. That is, someone might say they don't believe these witnesses, and that anyone's at liberty to take that position, but no one has ever provided any evidence that they didn't exist, they weren't who they said they were, or they weren't who the tradition says they are, uh, or that anything they wrote was incorrect. There is no evidence to debunk any of them. Uh, and I guess we could say, uh, for you know, as far as any other explanations of these things, other than the one that Jesus rose from the dead, there is no evidence for those other explanations, which just means that there's a lot of things that exist. Things that exist are best explained by, by one or another theory. My statement is that the actual resurrection of Christ as a historical fact is the best explanation of the alternatives available. Now, um, you know, I, I would assume that uh, Mark would regard himself as a skeptic about this. Um, but he's not the only skeptic. I'm a skeptic too. Everybody is or should be a skeptic because otherwise you're being gullible. A skeptic is someone says, I'm not going to believe that unless there's some good reason to believe that. And in that sense, I'm as much of a skeptic as an atheist is a skeptic. I'm just skeptical about different things and I'm skeptical on different grounds. If um, if Mark is skeptical, for example, about my explanation for those items I just listed, that is, he doesn't believe Jesus rose from the dead, then he's skeptical uh, about these things in spite of whatever evidences are available. He just is not impressed by the evidence, as many people are not. If I'm skeptical about whatever explanation he gives as an alternative, I'm going to say that I'm skeptical because there is no evidence that can be presented for an alternative view. There are theories people have had, I've heard a lot of them, but no evidence exists for them. So uh, everybody's skeptical. I'm just skeptical about things that uh, there's no evidence for. And therefore I'm an evidential skeptic. If my opponent has some alternative view as to the origin of these things, and has no evidence for any of the alternative views he has on it, then I would say his skepticism would be um, not based on evidence, but based on ideology. And I think that's very often the case with people who deny that Jesus rose from the dead. It's not so much that they have any evidence, it's simply that they have an ideology that rules it out without inquiry, or prior to inquiry, I should say. So I'm gonna just let that be my opening statement. You got it. And want to say, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, I'm your host, Dr. James. Want to remind you, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We have many more debates coming up. You don't want to miss them. So hit subscribe right now. We're going to kick it over to Mark for his opening statement as well. Thanks for being with us, Mark. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, James. Just tell me when my uh, screen is uh, viewable and uh, I will get started. Okay, fantastic. Hello, it's great to be back, and I'd like to thank uh, my opponent, Steve, for providing arguments to this debate. Um, I'd like to thank James for uh, and Modern Day Debate for hosting the debate, and also to the audience for giving me the time and attention to my case. Now, firstly, I would like to say that this debate is one that I, I do not invest a whole load of time in. Generally, it is upon the person making the claim to demonstrate proof, but I'll be presenting some reasons why we should consider the resurrection story myth or legend and nothing 
more. Um, it is in First Corinthians it stated, if Jesus did not resurrect, then your faith is futile. So most of my focus would be on the Bible and how much we can actually trust that what it says is actually true. Now, there's a tendency to have black and white thinking and say that either all of the Bible is true or none of it is, all of it is true or, you know, all of it is lies. But this is rarely the case with ancient texts. Usually they are stories and parables with some element of truth but used to impart some sort of message rather than an actual history book. And no, the Bible is not a history book. It does contain history, but it, it is the documents of a religion interested in promoting itself and preserving the ideas and beliefs of the people who wrote it, rather than the impartial recording of events as history books do today. So supernatural claims, altered documents, mythology, other fanciful tales, these are just the areas I'll be focusing on of why the Bible is not a reliable text for the recording of the history of the region and the presumed resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. Um, firstly, I want to mention how historians treat supernatural claims. Generally, historians do not give credence to supernatural claims in any historical text. So things like Heracles being the son of Zeus or, uh, Zeus or Romulus, the founder of Rome, being taken into heaven are generally things that one can't take into a literal historical account. Don't forget that the entirety of the Egyptian populace thought that the pharaoh was God who would rise into immortality after death. It, it doesn't matter how many people believe it. We need more evidence for the claim than just the religious texts of the day. Supporting evidence from sources outside the religion or faith would be good, but we have none of that for the resurrection. The four gospels are literally the only documents that claim there was a resurrection of Jesus, and these documents were copied from one another, not entirely accurately, as I will go into later. So I, I want to note some of the other resurrections that allegedly happened from Mesopotamia all the way to China, irregardless of how many rune stones that attest that Odin died and was reborn or hieroglyphs that have a serious comeback for life. This is not enough in any of these cases to demonstrate that these people resurrected. What happened with these figures was probably the same as what happened with Jesus. A legend was built around them. So I want to make a note, while we say in these accounts were contemporary, they are in fact written decades afterwards. Consider the resurrection allegedly happened in 30 to 33 AD. This gives about 33 to 40 years before Mark was written. Now, it does seem like a great amount of time, but consider how much a story can change in 30 years. For comparison, Trump had an attempted assassination two months ago, and there are already people claiming that there was a supernatural intervention that saved him. This is in the modern era, even when the event itself was recorded. Imagine how a story about a beloved leader could change in 30 years, back in a time when there was no TV or recordings, just word of mouth and oral history that were recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Or were they? Here is where problems get really bad for the credibility of the Bible. It is traditionally held by the early church that the four canonical gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is absolutely no certainty among scholars that this is the case. They think that Mark was not written by Mark as the author shows misunderstandings of Jewish customs, the geography of Judea, and completely misunderstands the Hebrew Bible. It, it very likely was a Gentile Christian outside of Palestine, possibly in Rome, um, Matthew copied heavily from Mark, so it's unlikely Matthew was actually written by Matthew. That being said, there's nothing to suggest that Luke and John were actually written by Luke and John. This brings into question the validity of what can only be charitably called eyewitnesses. If these books were not written by the disciples that were attributed to them, then they are not eyewitness accounts at all. So it's important to note that there are much more contradictions that I've highlighted wrong with the gospel story. In fact, the gospels cannot even agree on the date of the crucifixion. John says it was the day before Passover. The others say it was the day after Passover. There's contradictions on who found the tomb, whether the tomb was open when they arrived, whether an angel was there. In one gospel, Matthew, the angel actually rolled the boulder away when the women arrived. In one story, the women were so afraid they were told no one about the empty tomb, while in another they were, they were afraid. But so filled with joy, they rushed out to tell the apostles. And there's much more. Um, in Matthew, the, the empty tomb is found and the angel tells the disciples that Jesus will meet them in Galilee. How, however, in Luke, Jesus appears to the disciples and says, stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So what happened? Did they go to meet Jesus on a mountain in Galilee or did they stay in Jerusalem as, as commanded? Um, that thing is also very odd about the story in Matthew, that of the guards. Matthew's the only 
only gospel that claims guards were posted and the claim in Matthew that an unspecified amount of guards reported the absent body to the head priest as the story goes and angels scared them and they reported it to the Pharisees and chief priests who bribed the guards to make up a story that the body was stolen. This is a massive problem as the author wouldn't have any knowledge of this secret conversation. How did the author know that the, the, the chief priests had this conversation with the guards? They wouldn't have. And as Richard Carrier has pointed out, it looks like a intervention trying to explain away a possible problem with the story ahead of time. Um, so one of the things that most Christians don't know about this uh, is the long ending of Mark. These are passages 9 to 10 of the Gospel of Mark that scholars date to about, uh, Mark 16, I should say, that date to about the early second century, only appearing in texts after this point. The damning evidence for the long end of Mark is a change of tense. Earlier in verse 6, it says he has been risen when compared to verse 9 when it says he rose. This shows that someone added these passages to the text. Most notably, these are the passages about handling snakes and drinking poison, as well as the laying on of hands of sick people. Um, as scholars like Bart Ehrman have noted, we don't have any original text for the Bible. So how do we know what other passages has been added by the early church? We don't. We, if the people altered the text are more skillful in their deception, there may be some passages that were never in the originals that we don't know. This is a nail in the coffin of the Bible's credibility because we, if we did not find the manuscripts omitting the long ending of Mark, the earlier than the, the, the ones that had the long ending in, we would likely never know about this forgery in the Bible. So that brings me to the favourite passage about the resurrection, the zombie apocalypse. Um, so we can see here from Matthew, who claims there was an earthquake, saints rose from their graves and went around Jerusalem. So it's not really a question of whether Jesus rose from the dead, rather a question of whether Jesus, Jesus and the horde of saints rose from the dead. No other gospel mentions this, nor does it seem to be recorded by anyone, including Roman historians in the area. It seems to be this episode of Walking Dead that broke out in the area of Judea circa 0 AD and apparently seen by many went completely unremarked upon. This is an obvious story, a legend, a myth that's grown out of oral tradition. However, it is quite likely that the entire resurrection was a legend grown on oral traditions. A claimed entry, empty tomb with no corroboration stated as a matter of faith by the earliest Christians who thought the world was coming to an end upon the death of their leader. So I want to leave you with this thought. If Trump's assassination attempt had stories of angels and miracles occurring from the modern era a couple of months after the event, what do you think would happen in ancient Judea after 30 plus years by a people that already believed that Jesus would return and were prone to superstition, already believing in the supernatural? It is not a stretch to think that the legend grew over time, making itself into their stories and tales, and finally being written down an account that did not actually happen. Historians do have a word for these kind of things. It's mythology. Thank you. Thank you very much right. for that opening, Mark. We're going to kick it into the open dialogue. want to remind you folks, if you happen to have questions for the Q&A, feel free to submit them in the live chat. If you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, or if you want, you can have your question pushed to the top of the list if you use a super chat. And with that, thank you very much, gentlemen. The floor is all yours for that open dialogue. Let me let me just say this briefly, and then uh, we can talk about the individual things. All the things that Mark mentioned are things that an evangelical Christian has no difficulty addressing. In fact, I have addressed them at my website. Uh, it's thenarrowpath.com. Uh, the problem is finding them because there's over 1,500 lectures there. They're all free, and you can listen to them. And if uh, some of them are verse by verse, so you can go to the passages that are relevant to this, and my explanations are there. The reason I say that now is because obviously in a debate, I'm on, I'll probably have one or two minutes at a time to say anything, and then Mark will, will get his time too. And one thing that can be frustrating in a debate is to try to cover too much ground with too little time. Uh, he, he listed, uh, frankly, looks to me like, you know, a dozen or more points that I should answer, and I would love to answer, uh, but I know the time won't allow it, and I can't answer some, of, I, I could answer some of while we're here, but very little and very briefly. Uh, I would say this, that the theories that he, that he presented 
Uh, one is that the, the authors of the Gospels were not the people whose names have traditionally been associated with them. Well, what evidence is there that they're not? Of course, he said, if they're not those men, then why should we believe them? Well, that's a good question, if they're not. But why should we believe they're not? The earliest Christians who received these documents from the hands of their authors. I mean, these these uh, these books are not like the Urantia book or, or that, you know, allegedly just appeared, uh, you know, supernaturally. Uh, and somebody found it when he woke up in the morning in his bedroom. Uh, these are books written by members of the Christian community who were part of Christian churches and who wrote these books and handed them off to the people who certainly knew who it was that wrote them. Now, more than that, I believe the Christians had strong motivation to remember who wrote them. And therefore, in my opinion, it would be very hard for them to forget. Uh, within, uh, within a century of their being written, people like uh, Tatian and Irenaeus knew very well who wrote those books. And they said they, that was universally understood by Christians throughout the world. What's interesting about that is if they aren't written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we, we really have to come up with some theory of why those names were used or associated with them. Now, Matthew was an apostle, so someone might say, well, maybe someone would fakely attach his name, John, likewise. But who's Mark and who's John? And if, you know, they are among the most obscure people in the Bible. Luke is not even mentioned in the Bible, except in a, at the end of some of Paul's epistles, where he's listing a long list of people who are with him. He says, Luke is with me here. And that's all we know about Luke. Mark is okay. all obscure. Yeah, so, you're going through a lot of points here, Steve. So I'm, I'm going to go through them one by one. Hopefully you can keep up because you're, you're sort of saying putting a lot of points out there so yeah. basically we, we've got a lot of evidence to suggest they're not for instance luke may be written by luke he was a tax collector i believe and sort of may have written that however um john did not speak ancient greek um that's something that john didn't do and it's written in ancient greek so it's very unlikely john learned ancient greek as he was very old by the time of jesus's death um as i pointed out um in in um, um i believe it was mark um, there was a glaring error there as as the he didn't understand some of the customs of the area. He said that all Jews ate with with uh, uh, washed their hands before eating, but that wasn't actually true in the area. He also didn't have a knowledge of the geography of the area. Um, it is it is very likely he wasn't from Judea at all. So that couldn't possibly be marked. And I outlined that in my, my presentation. We can go through a bit of that if you do want to. Now, written, if, if what if they are not? Well, it all stems to the credibility of the Bible because you're basically saying, hey, we should trust these people as witnesses. But what if they weren't witnesses? I think that's very important. I think that that absolutely destroys um, the whole context of the Bible, that it was written by people in a religion with a motivation to make this religion surge and get greater and be appreciated. And you're sort of saying, hey, um, it was written by the members of, of that Christian community kind of thing, or, or it was given to the members of that Christian community. Was it? We don't know. That's the whole point. We don't just assume that these things are true. And I'm sort of saying, hey, we know at least one case where it wasn't written by Mark, could the yeah. others not be written by the others as well? And basically, we don't know. No scholar is claiming to know for sure that they were written by those those four apostles or not. Um, uh, uh, so you're saying that it's hard to forget who wrote them, but a lot of them are based upon oral traditions and oral stories. It's not really so much of, because it's not like they sat down and wrote a book these are tales and stories and scraps of manuscripts that have been put together into a coherent book. It's not like they they all sort of, you know, were bound up and then given to the people en masse. They were just documents that people had found. So no, I don't, I don't think that's a very, very um, um, satisfactory explanation at all. Um, it seems to be that they found these documents, attributed it to these people, but have no real way of saying who, who who wrote them at all okay so i see you're a very trusting person you trust people who have no evidence for their theories um you're more trusting than a christian is because you have no evidence that any of those things are true you have no evidence that they were not written as books you have no evidence that mark did not uh write the book the truth is 
the, the Jews that, Jesus, that Mark's referring to did in fact wash their stuff like that. Uh, not all Jews around the empire did. Mark is not describing the Jews around the empire. He's, he's describing the Pharisees in Jerusalem. Uh, he is not mistaken about geography. There are book length treatments of all the things you've said written by people who are believers who actually present data. You're not presenting data, you're, pre pre you're presenting claims. Uh, the truth is, the early Christians did have a reason to want to know, you know whether their sources were true or not, just like you and I would if we were starting to follow a new uh, ideology. We'd want to know something about its origins. We want to make sure they were true. Uh, you say these people had a motivation to promote a religion. I, I suppose you mean whether it's a true one or not. I'm not sure why anyone would want to promote a religion that they didn't believe was true. And if they did believe it's true, on what basis did they believe that? How uh, Jew, It began in Israel. Israel's where this started among Jews. All the writers were Jews except Luke. And uh, Jews, uh, do, you know, they're not more inclined than others to believe that a man would rise from the dead. They're, they were very skeptical about that. Jesus, his own disciples were skeptical, as, as we would expect. That's a very realistic story that they would be skeptical uh, of his resurrection they would have to have it proved to them to their satisfaction. And if they did believe, <clears throat> if they did come to believe these things, enough as the tradition say to even die for their testimonies of uh, veracity, what made them believe it? I mean, what, what they, they made up stories that had no roots in history and, and therefore they, they just decided, I guess this is the religion I'm gonna promote. Well, what are they gonna get out of that promotion? Uh, you know, Christianity was a persecuted religion for the first two, 300 years, actually. And uh, all the leaders, the apostles and most of the church leaders, were hunted down and, and killed in the arenas and, and otherwise. Uh, this is not a, a belief system that offers a lot of cushy advantages if it's not true. People who would embrace it and spread it would have to have some motivation for doing so. And in my opinion, the reason is because the facts they report are true facts. Uh, you know, I realize that there, what many people listening may not realize is that on the internet and frankly in, in theological books, there are two camps. There are those who come at the Bible skeptically and come up with theories like those that Mark has just presented about the origin of these books. There are those, however, who are equally good scholars. In my opinion, they appear to be more objective and they have answers to all these things, and they don't have to reach for them. They're, they're not hard to reach for. I mean, Mark has a long ending uh, in some manuscripts. It has a medium length ending in others. It has a short ending in some. Obviously, there's some question about the origin of those uh, the, the last 12 verses in Mark. But that doesn't raise any questions about the life of Jesus uh, and the general you know, character of the life of Jesus or his death or resurrection. And we don't depend on Mark entirely for those things. You mentioned there are different details about the resurrection. You know, is there one angel? There are two angels. Uh, did they go to Galilee or did they stay in Jerusalem? All of those are easily answered. Uh, it's not hard to believe that if there were two angels there and one of them was speaking to the women, that a, a record of it by some people might say, an angel told them this. An angel was there and told them this. Another man might say, yeah, well, there are actually two, but the other didn't deny that. Uh, when the angels told the women, tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee at a place I've prearranged with them. And then he appeared to them that night in Jerusalem. It's obvious the disciples he has in mind are not the apostles. They are the disciples in Galilee that he's going to meet with. And he apparently did. We have record yes. of him meeting the apostles up there too. But then they came back to Jerusalem uh, for the feast and they, and he arose for the, you know, around Pentecost time. Just so, to jump in. Oh, you might have been wrapping up there. So pardon if I'm jumping the gun. Just to be sure the free flow of the open dialogue keeps going, but I'll give you a chance. It sounds like you're already wrapping up there, Steve. Um, no, I'll, I'll let Mark go from there. I'm just saying that people need to know that Mark is saying many things, which I believe many people would agree with. Many people would agree with him, but there's no evidence of them. They are theories. There's certainly more. There's less evidence for those than there is for the belief that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, in my opinion. I mean, as a person who would, I have nothing to gain by believing Jesus rose from the dead if it's not true. I'd be as eager to be disabused of that view, if that's where the evidence led, as any man would be. 
but okay so this, this has got nothing to do with what you believe at all so you know that's that's irrelevant completely um you're sort of saying that jesus sort of you know jews did not wash their hands in the area yes but one of the the books they, they said that they did and also didn't understand the geography and also didn't understand the hebrew bible so there's a lot of evidence and this is evidence this is scholars looking at it and saying hey what can we actually tell about the writers and what they're actually doing what where are their mistakes where doesn't this add up to the other stories that have been given really we're looking for conflict and contradictions and that is a form of evidence you may not like it but it is um and and so and and plus like the, the burden of proof is really upon you you're saying hey this resurrection did happen the burden of proof is for you to show it um what i am doing is showing that these sources cannot be trusted to be the advisors of jesus if there is doubt that they actually wrote them and there is significant doubt um, the, the, the Bibles usually do have something in saying, hey, we cannot determine the authorship of these Gospels, and that is 100%. There is scholarly consensus that we can't establish the authorship of that, the no, that's not Gospels. So, no, now, sorry. I'm not finished. I'm not finished, Steve. You made a lot all of right, points. All, all right, just general. relax. Sorry, relax, guys. I, I want to I'm gonna jump in just to give Mark uh, roughly the same amount of time. Steve, I know that it's uh, there's a lot for each of you to unpack. I want to let Mark finish. Well, I, what I would suggest, Steve, and this is just, you know, what I would suggest is, is not bringing up so many points all at once, because then I wouldn't have to go through them all, and then you wouldn't lose track of them either. I'm, I'm very good at keeping track of points, but, you know, obviously you want to respond to them, and then you can't, because I've got to go through them. So maybe let's just do a couple of points at a time in future, and that may solve the problem. Um, just saying. So, um, what sort of? So, why did they believe? You sort of said, well, wh well, why would they believe it? And it's sort of the same question as why anybody believes any religion. If they were believing beforehand, and Jesus said that he was going to return, and he did not return, the legends and myths can be created that he did actually return. That the grave was empty. Do I know exactly what happened? No, I don't. But you have no evidence whatsoever for this resurrection. All you have are these stories, which they have massive glaring contradictions in them. I mean, did, did the apostles go to Galilee or did they stay in Jerusalem afterwards? Either they did one or the other. They could not have done both. Um, so, yeah, and, and sort of you're saying all of this can be easily answered, but you're not providing a lot of answers to them. And I, I want to go to a specific point, maybe. So that long ending of Mark, you're sort of saying, oh, well, there's a long, there's a middle ending, there's a shorter ending. But from what we can tell, that long ending was not in the original text. I, Does that make part of Mark a forgery? It doesn't make the authentic book of Mark a forgery. It may mean that after the authentic book was written, various okay. scribes added to it forgeries, yes. How yes. do you tell what's authentic and what's not? What's your determination for determining what's authentic and what's not? I would say what the the mass massive manuscripts agree about from the earliest to the latest would be authentic. Uh, where there's there's uh, differences, they're very minor in different manuscripts in most cases. But long long ending of Mark is an exception to this. It's a big a big difference. But uh, but almost all the differences between the Gospels are tiny uh, uh, and inconsequential differences uh and apart from those little differences the manuscripts are pretty much agreeable from the earliest ones we have to the latest ones we have but i mean you you made several comments that, that i'd love to answer but you said we should take one thing at a time um i would like to say about the contradictions uh mm -hmm. a, when you hear two different stories about the you know two different accounts of the same story and they don't contain the same information if you are already a hostile judge of the witnesses, you can say, oh, that's that's a contradiction, obviously. Um, or if you're not a hostile uh, you know, judge of the witnesses, you can say, oh, I can see how both those things are true. Uh, we do know that the Jews made frequent trips between Jerusalem and Galilee. Jesus did. It's on record throughout his whole life. And uh, he did. His disciples did go up to Galilee. There's record of that. They were seven of them were fishing in Galilee when they saw Jesus on one occasion. Uh, there's no doubt that they they did go up to Galilee, but they were in Jerusalem at the Passover, which is when Jews are supposed to be at, at, in Jerusalem, even Galileans like Jesus. Then they went to Galilee. Then they came back to Jerusalem for Pentecost, which is also a time when the Jews are supposed to be there. So that's not a strange thing. That's not a, not an unusual trip for them to make. 
And uh, yes, so when, Mac, when, when he when, did, when, Mac, you're, when you're talking contradictions, if if you have um, like you're saying a judge talking to two people, yeah, one says, "Hey, this event happened on this day." And another one says, hey, this happened on a different day altogether. And it's like a really important event. Like at that point, you can't really trust either of them. The better thing to do is we go out and find out what actually happened, because there is no real way that you're going to know who's actually right. Or maybe both of them are wrong. Maybe it happened on a third day and both of them are wrong about the day that it happened. This is the whole point. We, because of the contradictions, we don't know which story is actually true, if either. And that just hammers the credibility of the Bible. It, it's a holy book full of myth. It's not a history book. That's your faith statement. You have no proof but of that. It's not faith. What is? It's you, you believe it without evidence. No, no, no. A history book you know is... Myth. You do not know that it's myth. And you did not give an example of two witnesses saying different things happen on the same day differently. Give me an example of those of that kind of a contradiction you just described in the Bible. Um, well, um, I believe it was uh, John said that it happened before Passover, the day before the Passover, and all the other accounts say it happened after Passover, the day That's after Passover. That's not what Passover. it says. What happened, uh, Jesus was, uh, took the Last Supper at Passover, but uh, he was crucified the next day. Now, John tells us that when Jesus was on trial, the Jews did not want to go into Pilate's house and be defiled because they wanted to keep the Passover. This apparently is where you're getting the idea that John is saying they hadn't kept the Passover yet. The fact is the Passover is a week-long festival, the week of unleavened bread, and they wanted to keep the Passover. That is, they didn't want to, in the midst of that week, be disqualified from continuing it. So that they keeping the Passover is a week-long thing. It was the Paschal meal that all uh, all three synoptic gospels tell us they had the last supper at the paschal meal the night before jesus was crucified mm -hmm. but there was passover continued for seven more days after that yes but john passover said that passover, passover had gone before like it happened on the day after passover that that's what what was recorded no no you don't understand that's passover a is a single day followed by seven days the whole week is called passover it was the first day of that week that they had the last supper the rest of the week, the Jews were keeping the Passover also, and they didn't want to become defiled the second day into it so that they couldn't keep keep keeping it. That's that's what it says. Now, it doesn't say that Jesus that, was... Crucified. That sounds like apologetics to me. It sounds sort of like you're just trying to fit it into to but see, the, the narrative kind of thing. That's a very um, subjective, so, subjective judgment. And I, everything you say strikes me as atheist apologetics. So that's what we do. We present evidence. I'm presenting evidence. You're presenting theories. Now, the truth is, what I just said. No, about... you're not presenting evidence, Steve. You're not presenting evidence. You're just presenting claims. Whether that claim is within a sort of Iron Age book or speaking it directly, it's still just a claim. Where's your actual evidence that the resurrection happened? Evidence, that which is seen. All right. Where is it? In a, in a court of law. Mm-hmm. Testimony is considered evidence. It may not be compelling evidence, but that's what that's what evidence is. It's if somebody says, I was there, I saw this, well, that's part of the evidence of the case. It may be evidence that you reject, but it's not really it's not evidence. Okay. Can if can I walk into a court and give them a book of what people said they saw and would the court accept that? No, no, but if no, you no, no, absolutely but, they wouldn't. They would not they at all. The and reason why it is just basically what you're describing is essentially hearsay. You don't have any actual evidence for the resurrection. All you have are a bunch of stories written in a book and, and sort of this, this like you asked for contradictions. I brought up one. You sort of made this excuse that, oh, well, Passover can last a week. So they, no, they, they were talking about the Passover feast. You were wrong. John said. I didn't make it. Okay. Well, I, okay. I well, don't know, I don't know how uh, familiar you are with the Bible. How, how, I'm just curious because you're making statements. I'm pretty familiar, actually. It sounds like you're the one with secondhand knowledge. Do have you okay. studied the carefully? Well, when the when carefully? Mary, yes, when Mary got to the tomb, was the tomb shut or open? The tomb was open, as all Gospels tell us. Did an angel roll the boulder away from the tomb? Yes, before anyone got there. Before anyone got there. That's what all the Gospels tell us, yeah. 
Uh, so Matthew says that the stone was rolled away by an angel and the women witnessed that happen. No, they didn't witness it happen. I said it happened before they got there. They weren't there when uh, it happened. They got there and it was maybe we should look at the, the verse then on Matthew. Help, Help yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, while we do that, maybe you can address the... Um, uh, while we're on Matthew, maybe you can address the... Um, um, the the people the saints rising from the dead you want to address that yeah right yeah, yes, that's not yeah. A problem. that's not a problem to me the bible teaches that during jesus lifetime he raised a number of dead people to life and that when he rose from the dead himself a number of others came to life as a result now you suggested hordes of them there's no suggestion of hordes it says many now you know how many would there have to be to be an amazingly a large number of people walking out of their graves. I'd say five or six would be an amazing amount. Uh, I'd say, frankly, three would be an amazing amount, but it's probably more than that if they say many. What if it's 10? Okay, oh, what's the problem with that? I have no problem with that any more than the raising of Lazarus or Jairus's daughter. And none of the other gospels recorded this. None of the other gospels recorded Lazarus rising except John. There's many mm -hmm. stories about Jesus that are only found in one gospel. And the reason is, it's as John yeah. said. John said many other things, uh, wonders happened that cannot be recorded in this book because there were too many to record in any book. Uh, and so we have uh, a number of stories for which we have two or three or even four witnesses and many stories in all the Gospels for which there's only that witness. Yeah. Well, I, I think that somebody in Rome, like some of the historians of, of the, in the area at the time, would have noticed or, or people would have told them about you know, a bunch of guys rising from the dead. But I just want to um, read Mark, Matthew 28, sorry. Um, at the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled the, back the stone and sat on it. Right. And they came and saw that. They came and saw the angels. Yes, so... Uh, well, it says that they went to look at the tomb and then there was an earthquake and an angel came down and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Actually, it doesn't say that those follow in that order. It just mentions both things happen. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you so, are... So who who is writing it to say this happened? Who Who's writing it? Because it's written in the way that an observer would observe that those events happening. So you would presume that they're writing what the women saw, but you're now you're saying they're not. They're not writing what the women saw at all. So whose testimony are we getting here? Who's it coming from? I got there and found a, an, an, two angels, actually, sitting on the stone. And the no, stone not in Matthew. Away. Pardon? Not in Matthew. No, not in Matthew, but it, we have that information from uh, other sources. We have more than one source of every historical account we know anything about. And uh, we have four historical sources about this. And as you combine them, you find that the women got there and they found uh, that the stone had been rolled away and there were two angels there. Now, I think that they wouldn't have to watch it rolled out of the way for them to deduce, oh, I get it, these angels moved the stone. They weren't sure who could do it. When they were on their way there, they were talking among themselves. Who's gonna- How do you know that? How do you know that? It's recorded that they said that, yeah. It's recorded that they said that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you've got you've got an incident here of basically the the women going down, the angel rolls a stone away, um, you know, and you're sort of saying, hey, they just made it up and and assumed that the angel did it. That's well, what you're saying. They saw the evidence of it right there before their eyes. Okay. So why did the others not record that evidence? Well, you say they didn't. Yeah. I think you'll find that there are other rec recordings in the Gospels of uh, of the angel moving the stone. Uh, so I, I mean, I don't know why you're saying they didn't. But uh, which which passage is it? Pardon? Which passage has the angels moving the stone and the other parts of the text? I didn't actually bring a Bible to this debate. I because I wasn't planning to debate the Bible. But, but I will say this: that sorry, that's is that a bit odd? I mean, you're in a, a sort of. I mean, this is focused around the Bible pretty heavily, right? No, no, it's actually focused on the evidence for the resurrection, which includes the Bible. And we, what other we all... evidence is there? What other evidence is there? 
Well, there's the church fathers, uh, the traditions of the uh, of the church fathers. Uh, there is, uh, I, again, I said the very fact that Christianity took off at all deserves some explanation. And uh, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead provides the best one, because, at least to me, it does, because there's no better explanation out there of where Christianity arose from. Okay, so so here's the thing. Even though church fathers may have believed it, that does that isn't evidence. You know, you can't you can't go into court and say, hey, well, you know, the people who um, were around at the time believed this person did it. So that's evidence. If they didn't see it and they didn't witness it, that doesn't really matter. Like you're you're sort of using this word evidence, but evidence is evident. It, it basically has to be able to be presented in some way. And you're basically saying, hey, a bunch of guys at the time believed it. Well, fantastic. But, you know, a bunch of people around Muhammad believed everything he did. A bunch of people around the pharaohs believed they were gods. It doesn't matter what they believe. What matters is what you can present. And at the moment, all we've got is, hey, this book says a thing. And that's it. Yeah, and a bunch of people who read the sources you're quoting believe them too, without any evidence. You have given me many statements for which there's no evidence except you read it somewhere. Bart Ehrman or someone else said it. And you say, well, I, that's, I'm going to present that as if that's reality. But he wasn't well, yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of scholars. Well, Bart Ehrman isn't saying it never happened. He's saying why we shouldn't trust the Bible because it has forgeries in it, because it has contradictions in it, because it has these problems with it that we shouldn't treat it like a history book because it's not a history book. It's a religious text. Um, it has history in it, as I said. I mean, you can take how people, excuse me, Steve, just one second, just one second. You can take how people lived and things that they did, but you're sort of saying, hey, we should treat this like an actual history book that somebody sat down and wrote as a history. And that's not what it is. That's not how historians treat it. It's treated as a religious text. Okay, that's what you say. You know, Luke wrote most of the history in the New Testament. He wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. He has been yes. tested. His, his facts, especially in the book of Acts, have been tested against uh, secular historians and archaeology abundantly. Uh, historians have tremendous respect for his historical accuracy. But more than that, he did claim to be writing a history book. In, in the very opening verses of Luke, he said, you know, he said, many before me have sought to write down, you know, the stories, uh, you know, of what happened among us. He said they happened. He said, I've known these eyewitnesses myself. He said, I have had thorough knowledge of this uh, from the beginning, and therefore I'm going to write down a, uh, or he said, a, uh, I forget the word he uses. It's a, a basically a, a logical presentation of the story. He said, so that you might be certain of this of the truth of what you've heard about this. Now, Luke right. could be lying. Luke could be lying. He's, yeah. Certain, yeah. He's, not, he's not saying he's not writing a history book. He is saying he's writing a history book. Well, do you, no, that we don't treat it like a history. Like if somebody writes the Quran, then we don't treat that like a history book. It's not no, a don't. book of history because it's governed by the religion, which is governed by the propaganda and beliefs that come with the religion. There's no getting away from that. That's just religious belief. They put in the books what they would like the world to see them as. That is just the way they operate. Now, Luke, who was supposedly a tax collector, did have some sort of, you know, sort of scholarly um, no, thing. But we don't know. Excuse me, Steve. You've you've you go on for a long time. I would like to be able to talk. Um, now, it, it, we don't even know for sure that Luke wrote Luke. That's just a matter of faith by you. You're just saying, well, I take it on faith that the church fathers were right when it, when they say it's Luke. We don't know how long after the 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 uh, um, um, supposed resurrection was Luke written. Well, you know, you ask the question as if you're interested in the answer. I can give you, I in fact, I have an hour long lecture answering those questions. How we know that at, at my website, which you can listen to. You won't give me an hour to talk about an hour, so I'd take it gladly. But I will say this. First of all, I'm just when I said Luke was a physician, I was just trying to correct you. You said you said he was a tax collector. He was a physician. That's not me refuting any point you're making, except just a point of fact. Okay. But um, so the point here is that you were saying that these books are not written as history. I said Luke said he was writing as history, and his story resembles very closely Mark and Matthew's story, which sounds like 
they had the same intention. So if you say they're not history, I'd like to hear the evidence that they're not. Well, it, it doesn't resemble it closely. I don't remember there being a zombie apocalypse in Luke. Um, maybe you could point that out to me. There wasn't in there. there. There's no um, I think of Lazarus in Luke either. So what? No, yeah, no. It, it's it's major events that you would expect somebody to write down. Like if you've got a historian and you have this event, you would hope that the historian document everything that happens during that time as much as possible. Now, saint, an earthquake, saints rising from the dead, walking around, meeting people in Jerusalem, that is not just a significant event. That is, a, uh, that is something that absolutely a historian should be writing down. But somehow, even though this, according to you, happened, these saints rose up and they went and they spoke to people and people were like, wow, it's dead people wandering around. Luke didn't record it. So if even if he was trying to wrote, write a history book, the fact that he did not record a bunch of dead people coming back to life means that he failed abys um, abysmally. I mean, what kind of historian doesn't write an a event of that significance? It, it's ludicrous. So okay, that, that tells me right. it probably didn't happen. And neither did the other sort of fanciful stories in this book. I believe you asked a question, so I'd like to answer it if I could. What, sure. kind of, what kind of historian does not record every major thing that happens over a period of three or four years? Every historian in the world. I mean, if you wanted to write a, uh, uh, a history of the deaths by COVID-19 over the past, say, three years, uh, you probably would record uh, a sampling of them, and you'd figure that people would understand that this is just a sampling. I can't tell you all of them. Now, every one of the gospel writers record Jesus raising people from the dead. They don't all mention Lazarus. Only John mentions that. They don't all mention these people who came out of the graves when Jesus rose. But they all mention uh, others, Jairus' daughter, uh, the son of the wood of Nain. Uh, resurrections from the dead are included in all of them. But I, you say that a historian should write everything of significance that happened in a period. No historian has ever attempted to do that. What these historians were trying to do as John tells us, he says, there's many other miracles Jesus did, but I can't record them all for you. He said, I'm, I've recorded enough of them so that you can know that you have reason to believe. And that's exactly what these guys were doing. They were trying to include just enough evidence, enough stories of various kinds, not just resurrections from the dead, but many others, so that their readers yeah. would say, here's, here's why we believe in him. Okay, well, I mean, your analogy about sort of, um, you know, COVID, the, the millions of deaths during COVID, I think that's a really bad analogy, and it's a false analogy. And the reason why is because deaths happen every day. And there's millions of events happening in order to, you know, document all of them. Yeah, I agree, that's an impossibility. But you're talking about people coming back to life, which doesn't happen every day. It's it's a very, very unusual event. And you're talking about 10, 11 events that people who were with Jesus at the time in the area completely missed. But Matthew, who was with him, managed to pick up on it. So it's not an analogy that actually works. It's more like, you know, you live in a, a village of a thousand people, nobody ever dies, and then 11 people die. Of course, a historian is going to write about it. It is an incredibly uncommon occurrence. Um, and that is what people coming back from the dead is. Not that, you know, I think anybody can come back from the dead. You haven't presented any kind of evidence that, that Jesus came back from the dead at all. Okay. You say the burden of proof is on me to prove that he did. Yes. Uh, I would say that in a court of law, if people, several people gave witness to an event, that it may not be proven by their testimony, but it would be seemingly uh, the burden of evidence would be on those to say that they're they're lying, that you can't trust them, especially if they are not known to have ever lied, they are not known to be incompetent. Uh, what is it that makes you so sure that these stories are not true? Okay, so um, the the what you've described, a court would never accept. So there's multiple burdens of proof on a court. It depends on what kind of court you're in. Like criminal court, it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. So in that case, it would not even approach. It's just a few people saying, hey, this person threw a rock and broke something. No, we would not take that. We would need much more evidence in order to 
um, you know, prosecute somebody for that for a crime. If you have um, a civil court, it's sometimes preponderance of the evidence, where depending on the reliability and the uh, credibility of the witnesses, you may overcome that burden. But your problem is you can't even show these were the witnesses. You, you've got documents written 30 something years after the fact with no guaranteed authorship of them. Um, just just claiming they're they're correct because somebody wrote them that we don't even know who it was. No, that wouldn't overcome anything in a court. It wouldn't even come close. So yeah, that that's a pretty bad example you give. Now, okay. why don't I believe them? Hang on a second. Why I don't believe them is because um, I'm not sure if you understand skepticism completely. So skepticism is only believing in things when a um, substantial amount of evidence has been given to warrant them. And the more grandiose the claim, the more um, unlikely the claim, the more evidence is required to convince somebody. Like if I say I've got a pet dog, okay, you might believe that people have dogs, sure, whatever. If I say I've got a pet dragon, you would need a lot more evidence. If I say I've got a pet angel, you would need a ton more evidence. Now, um, so when, when somebody says, hey, some, some itinerant preacher was crucified in uh, Judea circa 0 AD, I'm like, cool, all right, yeah, probably. If somebody says, hey, he then rose from the dead, you need more evidence than just the religious texts from that religion reporting that this happened from unknown authors that I don't know. So that is what skepticism is. Um, you do not have any kind of evidence to show this is actually the case, and people do not rise from the dead as described in the Bible. What kind of evidence would you like to see uh, a Christian present? If, if in well, fact, the story is true, what kind of evidence would you like to see? Yeah. Well, well, for a start, I mean, you know, something not from the Bible would be fantastic. So, uh, you know, extra biblical, but that doesn't exist. Oh, wait. Um, That's not true. And all okay, the so what have you got? All the four gospels were extra biblical when they're written. There was no New Testament book until 300 years later. They yes. were independent witnesses. Yes, but you're talking about a series of documents that from the long ending of Mark, we know has been changed. We know things have been inserted. We don't have the original. So we can't be sure of what else has been included. And the church has a history of falsifying records. Like Where? with well, where's Testimonium it? Flavius, for instance, where they yeah. added the section on Jesus, and it's very evident they added the section on Jesus because they referred to Jesus by Christos. What do you know why that's a problem? Uh, uh, because Christos is uh, Latin instead of Greek, and it, it means the Messiah. Yes. The problem is, is Josephus was a Jew. He never refers to Jesus in his other works as uh, there, there's another part where he says that Jesus, the, the brother of James, he, so he says Christ. that he was called um, um, Christ, not right. is Christ. And, Je and, and Josephus was a Jew. He never would have written because he didn't believe that, that Jesus was the Messiah. So he never would have written that. And the uh, flow, well, the flow of the paragraph, if you take that section out, it flows perfectly, just like all of other Josephus's work. But in the Testimonium Flavius, if you put that in, it, it's broken up and it's got something that a, a Jewish person would not put in there. It's an obvious addition by the early church. And a lot of this went on back then. How do you know? Falsifying documents. How do you know this? I, I just I just told you. I no, just you told you. You said a lot of this yeah, went up. If, yeah. if, if your theory is that the Flavium Josephus uh, theory about the, the testimony in there is uh, that Christians have interpolated that, which is a theory yes. that is possible. It is possible that that's true. That's not showing that this went on a lot. Where, where, did, where else did it go on that you know about? Well, I mean, I'm pointing at the long ending of Mark, which you still haven't really explained why you know, I don't, the, the I don't need to explain how some people add things to books that exist. What I'm saying is we have thousands of manuscripts which don't have that or that, that do, you know, that don't all say the same thing about that. There's different endings for Mark. But that just means that someone added some things at the end of Mark. 
but the majority of the material in the Gospels, and by majority, I say scholars would say 97.3% of the material in the Gospels is the same in all the 5,000 Greek manuscripts we have. So well, well, it, wait, wait a second, a lot wait a second. Of going on here. This, is, this question was why I don't believe the, the, what would make me convince me that the, the stories in the Bible are true. And I'm telling you, like things that would be outside the purview of the church, and as, as Bart Ehrman does point out, if, if this is like, we don't have the originals to check it against. We don't know if anything else was added. You don't know for sure because we know things were added. We, we know that. And you just admitted things were added. It is a forgery. So it is possible that there's other things, even very, very significant passages that were added that we don't know about which is why you cannot trust these sources because they, one, we, we don't know if they came from primary authors, no idea. We cannot demonstrate that to be true. Number two, forgeries have been added and only picked up on when we found older manuscripts and we don't have the originals to check against. And the thing about having the thousands of manuscripts, they're all copied off one another. In fact, one of the early church fathers was adamant and, and very outraged that errors kept making its way into these manuscripts because they were being copied by scribes and errors were occurring and, and in translation errors were occurring. That's why there's, you know, I don't know how many versions of the Bible, like hundreds by now, um, versions of the Bible, all with different sort of interpretations. It's, it's a game of telephone. It's not exactly like that at all. You, you, Bart Ehrman's field of expertise, of course, is textual criticism. I don't know how much you've looked into textual criticism. I've actually been reading textual critics for about 45 years, and I would say that Bart Ehrman's are fringe ideas among textual critics. Uh, most textual critics would say that the changes that have occurred in copying between the Gospels and their, you know, the early and later manuscripts are minuscule and insignificant. In fact, most of the differences that have been wrong, and Bart Ehrman mentions this too, by the way, in his writings, are things like the, the word order of a sentence is different in one manuscript than the other. It says the same thing. You know, one is a, spe a spelling mistake, uh, you know, uh, you know is, is another thing that occurs thousands of times. Each time something like that occurs, they call it a change, a difference, but it's of no significance. The truth is, that the testimony of all the manuscripts are essentially the same on every story about Jesus, with the exception of two major cases. One is the long ending in Mark, uh, which obviously someone added something to, but no one added anything to the material before that is the point, nothing significant. And so how do you know? How do you know that? How do you know nobody added anything okay. to the material before? Well, let's how do you know that? Way. Let's just put this way. From the because earth. Mark Mark is <laughs> the <laughs> earliest uh, manuscript. It's the earliest manuscript. Sorry, just go to ahead, give James. Steve a chance to answer your question. Okay. Yeah, how do I know that? I don't know it beyond question, but there is no evidence against it. We have manuscripts dating from the early fourth century and from all the centuries since then until the printing press was invented. As I said, about five thousand manuscripts. The changes that you say were continually made are not found in these manuscripts. That's why I say it wasn't changed. Now, if things were changed before the earliest manuscripts, who can say? None of us know. You can argue that they were. I can argue that I don't think they were. Neither of us can prove our point. But there's certainly no evidence that the uh, copyists were extremely careless and, and you know, frequently added things. Uh, once in a while, apparently someone did. Uh, but we can tell when that happened because we can compare one manuscript with another. That's, that's the joy uh, of having textual criticism. Uh, we can compare the manuscripts to see what has and what has not changed and the things that have but, changed. Uh, but you don't know, sure. you don't know that there wasn't something added um, because, you know, we're talking 30 years past the date um, where the earliest manuscripts for Mark, which was the earliest um, about, you know, sort of 63 to 70 um, um, AD. Um, you don't know that something else wasn't added. You don't know that. Well, what I do know is that you you yourself said Mark was written 30 to 35 years or 40 years after the events, right? So sure. there would have been, you said that earlier in our talk today. You, you, you made that point in your first presentation. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, therefore, when Mark was written, 
there were a lot of people still living who would have been contemporaries with the apostles and with Jesus. And we never have any record of, of people saying, wait a minute, I was there and that never happened. Now that doesn't mean it did, that, that it did happen, but I'm saying that if you're gonna publish an allegedly historical work, which is what Luke did and Mark did and Matthew did, and you're gonna publish it in the very area as Matthew did where the events actually allegedly took place, and you're gonna do it within the lifetime of very many people who lived there all their lives, you're taking a great risk if you're gonna make up stuff that didn't happen at all. Now, well, there was a lot of people that believed that that those events did not happen and they were the Jewish people in the area at the time because they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. It was only the very small amount of Christians in the area that did. So, oh, yeah, yes. they published it in the area. But any sort of claim by the Jewish residents to say, hey, that that didn't happen. It was ignored because they were a religion and said, hey, these are the, the, the gender they, they don't believe. That's very naive because to say that the gospels could cite the writers of the gospel could silence the Jews from telling the truth about things is a very naive suggestion. I don't think the Jews, I don't think the gospels were written by people who dominated Jewish uh, nation. What I would say is this that the got the Jews in the Talmud tell us that Jesus was crucified for doing magic. Okay. Now, this is seemingly a backhanded way of saying that some kind of supernatural things apparently did happen. And the, and the Jews crucified him for doing them. Now, obviously, they described them as magic. In fact, interestingly, the Gospels tell us that the Pharisees accused Jesus of doing magic and, and working by the power of the devil. So, you know, the, the Gospels actually are quite correct about what the Jews said about it. But the Jews did not deny that Jesus did these things. They simply did not want him to be the Messiah. They had a political interest in the matter. And therefore, they, they simply wanted to discount these things as evidences. The, the Christians were the ones who didn't have any desire to discount them as evidences. So yeah, but you're sort of saying people of contemporaries, people in the area would have realized that the resurrection didn't happen. And I'm saying there was people in the area that denied the resurrection happened. It's, it's basically you're saying, well, everybody, you know, contemporaries in the area said it happened. Yeah, everybody in Jesus's group, his religion, his following who followed that leader believed that it happened and all the people outside believed that it didn't happen um right. so you know and and you know so so the the whole point that you're saying that hey if they published it people would have had something to say about it yeah people did have to say about it it's just you discount them because they're not part of your religion just well, like you discount anybody that isn't part of your religion that says hey we should not trust these books you just discount them. Wait, 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 wait. I don't discount everybody, but I would like to see what evidence they have for their position. Now, I don't know of anybody uh, in the You've first. You've given it. You've I, given I, it. I, just to let, all right, just the, to let Steve I finish too. I have a sentence. I'm, I'm, I'm mid sentence right now. I don't know of anybody in the first century who wrote a book saying, no, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Now, you're right. Many people then and now have never believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And I'm not, I never said that many people, uh, that everyone said he was, I said that the Jews acknowledged that Jesus worked miracles. I wasn't talking about his resurrection. And they, they acknowledged that he did things that were supernatural and that which they interpreted as magic. You were saying that, you know, it, it, people, if Jesus had done these things, people would have known it. Well, the Jews did know it. That's what I'm saying. They did know what he did. Now, why didn't they believe in the resurrection of the dead? Well, for a number of reasons. One of them is the same reason that they didn't accept his miracles as proof he's the Messiah. They didn't want to uh, see him as the Messiah. Uh, they didn't have an alternative uh, answer for what happened to his body that makes any sense. Yeah, so I, I think actually the Jewish people thought that Jesus was a false prophet. He was claiming to be um, some, uh, the son of God or, or the vessel of God. And that was very, very unholy in the Jewish mind. So it wasn't right. this, well, he did miracles. No, they, A, they didn't call it miracles. B, he was convicted of, uh, um, um, being, a, claiming to be the Messiah when he did not fulfill the, the Jewish criteria of being the Messiah. Um, or so they claim, you know, they say he did not feel fulfill the criteria to be the Messiah. So it wasn't so much that he was doing magic as that he was claiming to be God is is more or the Messiah is more their issue. Um, but you don't have. Before we take another um, point. Could I just answer that? Because you're going to go to sure. something. else. Pardon? It's OK. Yeah. OK. I didn't say 
that Jesus was crucified for doing magic. I'm saying that's what the Talmud says he was crucified for. You are saying he was crucified for other reasons, and you're getting your information from the Gospels, because we don't have any other information that tells us that Jesus was crucified for saying he was the Son of God. Only the Gospels tell us that, and you're apparently taking them as reliable. The, the Talmud, which is only a couple centuries later, was the Jewish tradition that Jesus was crucified for the, the miracles he did. You're right, they didn't call them miracles because they didn't want to credit him. They called them magic. What we would call miracles would be called magic by somebody who doesn't believe in God, of course. Well, I mean, I, I don't think they sort of said he was doing magic. I think they said he was a sorcerer um, guilty of apostasy, um, but he left the Jewish tradition. Yeah, a sorcerer is a magician, yeah. Yeah, but um, I don't think it, where, where is the um, where is the evidence of him doing magic? They called him a sorcerer. He didn't. But he didn't. Well, okay, so where is the the evidence of him doing anything supernatural in the Talmud? In, in the statement that I just made, that they said that he was crucified as a sorcerer, and as a sorcerer, right? Right. Now, what a sorcerer is is a magician. Yes, but there's no, like, you're saying that they backed up your claim that he did all of these, what you call miracles, what they called magic, and you are actually misrepresenting it, because nowhere in the Talmud does it say that he did magic, it just says he is a sorcerer that committed apostasy, so you're being very deceptive with your language by sort of saying, hey, they confirmed, hey, stop, they confirmed that he did these deeds, these magic or miracle, miraculous deeds. No, they didn't. They simply said he was a sorcerer, and a sorcerer could be someone simply dabbling in that kind of thing. Doesn't say that he did magic, doesn't say that he did miracles, just said he was a sorcerer, guilty of apostasy. Hey, suppose there was a woman that we both knew, and she mm -hmm. told you that she hated you because you were a man, and she hates all men. And I later spoke to you and said, I think she hated you just because you were a male human being. And you say, no, no, she didn't say I was a male human being. She says I was a man. Well, that's what you're saying about me. The word sorcerer and magician are the same thing in the Bible. Simon the sorcerer was also known in Latin as Simon Magus, the magician. Magician and sorcerer are the same thing. And so when they said he was a sorcerer, that is saying he did magic. And if you want to make that mean something else, you can do all you can try as hard as you want. I think you're desperate there. Well, I think that you're sort of taking more out of it and saying, hey, the, the stories of the New Testament are true because the Talmud says that he's a sorcerer. But that's not necessarily the case. I, I don't think that, you know, sort of backing you up on the actual events that he did simply labeling him a sorcerer as one of the things that the Jewish people did because he was following some kind of path that to them was unholy. Um, you know, not I'm not making judgment on whether it was or was not holy. I'm just saying that that's what the Jewish people thought at the time. But you've sort of said, hey, the resurrection, you know, if, if it didn't happen, there would be people speaking up and that there were people speaking up. And like I pointed out in my opening, the, the whole idea of um, um, the guards at the, the the thing, which only is in one of the, the Gospels, um, it shows that they were worried um, because they're giving accounts of conversations, private conversations between the Pharisees or, or the chief priests, I believe it's called, and the guards, which none of the, the, the um, apostles or anybody associated with Jesus were witness to. Um, so it kind of is saying, well, if anybody asks they stole the body, that let's bribe the guards to say that 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 happened and try to make it seem like that isn't what happened. Can I answer that? You just yeah. said that you said that none of the apostles or those close to them were privy to conversations uh, by the Sanhedrin, for example, with Rome. And yet the Bible tells us there were members of the Sanhedrin who became Christians. Now, Nicodemus being one of them, Joseph of Arimathea, another, and, and the book of Acts tells us many priests also became believers, which are the same people we're talking about here. Now, therefore, when Luke or Matthew or any other writer, decades later, wished to interview people for what they knew about the situation who were there, there, there might very well easily be uh, Nicodemus. How do you know that? How do I know what? Well, see, what a history book would do, it would say, this is what this person saw. And this, this is your major problem, 
you're looking at these books, say, by Matthew, for instance, and you're assuming it's written by Matthew, but you're, you're, it's not a history book. It's not outlining credentials, where the information comes from, how the information got to them. It's just making a faith claim. And then you're just saying, well, this is how it could have happened. This is how it might have happened. There's nothing to actually suggest that that's actually what happened. Let me let me say this. There's nothing to suggest any alternative either. We're trying to make sense of the origin of certain stories. Okay. Yeah, there's alternative. There's when an alternative. We since we we weren't there ourselves, we don't yes. know exactly what happened. So we have to say, well, what makes sense? And and Luke mm -hmm. said that he had interviewed eyewitnesses. Okay. No doubt the other gospel writers did too. They didn't tell us how many people they interviewed. Ancient historians didn't always quote their sources like modern ones do. They they weren't uh, they didn't go to universities where they had to have footnotes and things like that. Uh, we're talking about ancient historians who got their information and recorded it without necessarily having to footnote it. And uh, so Matthew doesn't tell us where he got that information. I'm saying you said how could they know it? I'm saying well it's not difficult for them to know it. It since some of the Sanhedrin were in the church after Pentecost and that's where Matthew lived. And uh, and he easily, I mean, why wouldn't they talk about these things? I mean, that'd be the kind of things they'd talk about the most, I would think. So I would suggest there could be very good sources for that conversation. And and a number of other conversations that the Gospels record that occurred, uh, you know, not in front of the disciples among them, you know, that the, uh, that the Sanhedrin said that we have members of the Sanhedrin ended up being in the church and therefore available for interviews. And that's how well, I think. That's well, I think the point, I think you've just reinforced the point that it isn't like a modern history book, and it isn't even um, very credible for history at the time. I, I mentioned um, um, Josephus, who kept very detailed records of where the information came from, how he heard of it, who he heard it through, um, and, and kept very detailed accounts. So Tacitus at the time kept detailed accounts of where everything came from. So, yeah, they're not written like history books, I grant you. But, you know, that's not to say, well, because at the time they didn't know how to write history or they'd just omit things or they'd just have things flow on by. No, there were writers at the time who were recording this kind of thing and can be a lot more reliable than, than these, these four people that, again, we don't even know that they wrote it. To say that these Gospels were not written in the same manner as either modern or even ancient historians wrote, is yes. not they weren't writing history. History means stories about things that really happened. Now, these men said these things happened. Some of them, uh, if they are who everyone historically has understood them to be, some of them are eyewitnesses. Some don't even claim to be. And that's the interesting thing. Again, Mark and Luke were not even eyewitnesses and don't claim to be. But the And the early church, if they were going to assign false authorship, to these books, they're not going to pick a guy like Mark or Luke to assign. They're going to assign it to someone who was an eyewitness. What they do is they simply kept a knowledge of who passed these books to them as the authors. Now, of course, uh, in my opinion, uh, the church fathers would have kept track of many of the details. And we do, we do, for example, have Papias at the end of the first century saying Matthew first wrote uh, his his book partially in Aramaic. And it was later translated into Greek. Uh, he said about Mark, Mark was Peter's interpreter. Peter preached in Aramaic and Mark translated into Greek. Now, you said earlier that Mark didn't know ancient Greek. But, I don't but know Papias know. based um, most of his stuff on Erebus, wasn't it? Erebus? Um, no, he, he said, he, no, in the passage where he gives that information, Papias said that whenever he met anyone who had known the apostles. Asibius. he Eusebius was not born yet. No, no, Eusebius was in the fourth century. Um, uh, Papias was at the end of the first century. Uh, he was a generation after the apostles. And he said that, he actually says, whenever I met anyone who had been with them, who knew them, uh, I would ask them about things. I'd want, to, I'd want to get it straight from their mouths. He said, I wasn't even interested in the ones who would say the most things, but those who had the most credibility and the most knowledge and the truer things. So, I mean, yeah, the early Christians were interested in knowing the truth. You might think they weren't, but how would you, why would you judge somebody like that and say, well, they weren't interested in the truth? They were. They were as interested as we would be. Um, 
Well, I'm, I'm not saying that they weren't interested in the truth. What I'm saying is that legends grow out. Like, this is the sort of black and white thinking that I outlined in my opening. You, you're sort of going, well, it's either all a lie or it's all true. And what I'm saying is that people, when events happen, especially back in those times, and we see this a lot with myths and legend building, then an event will happen and people will talk about it. It'll get blown out of proportion. It'll It'll get more and more fanciful as time goes on and by the end of it 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 becomes its its own thing i'm not saying that people intentionally went out to lie but when you have the leader of a religious sect around that time people are going to you know just make it a bit more fanciful why? so i i truthfully what do you mean why yeah untruthfully you mean well, do you think that Trump's assassination was stopped by an angel? No one can say, because no one saw one. No if, one can if, say. Somebody wants to apply their own religious theory well, to something that everyone saw. That's their business. I wouldn't trust their theory because there's no witnesses. No, and that's exactly what I'm saying. We shouldn't trust their theory. Thank you. I, they didn't. What they said is they didn't give us theories. They gave us a record of what Jesus said and did. They published that record in the same parts of the world and at the same time that many contemporaries were living there who would have seen him and could have caught them in that. Uh, I'm saying that, you know, see, Alexander the Great, uh, you know, th there are records of Alexander the Great that say that he performed a bunch of miracles. The trouble yeah. is no, no such records appear until about 400 years after he died. You know why? Because it takes a long time for accurate historical memory to be displaced by myth. We don't know of any case where a person who actually lived uh, was was you know there's was deified or something in the generation of those people who saw him and knew him Romulus Romulus you think Romulus is a real historical character the, the founder of Rome like well I don't know well, That's the, by we still don't you know, we still don't walls? okay can I answer can I answer yeah. Yeah. yeah, we don't know whether Romulus existed or not, but I don't believe he was suckled by wolves, and I don't believe he sort of did all these miracles on behalf of the gods to raise Rome up, and I don't believe that he went to, to heaven after he thinks, but the people at the time believed he did, and it may have been a very real person it was based upon. You're basically proving my point. You get a person who does an amazing thing, like they, they significantly helped the building of Rome people create myths about them they were this person that never died they were held up to heaven and that becomes the story and that happened because there were in rome statues to romulus the founder of rome that happened within his lifetime i doubt that that's true you said there were people at the time that believed this when in fact you said that yeah would have witnessed that they would have witnessed the building of rome why would they believe it happened a different way than it really happened if they were there well, why would people think that an angel stopped a bullet? Oh, it's on that, that's their theology. TV. The theology, that's not, that's not an observed thing. That's not something anyone could prove wrong or but, right. But it's, if those people were questioned, they may claim that they witnessed an angel stop the bullet. That's well, their testimony. I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe their testimony unless they had some better evidence than Thank that. Thank you. No, no I, I totally agree. I, I I completely agree. I would not believe right. their testimony unless better evidence can be provided. That sums up this entire debate in a nutshell. Okay. Well, the point is that we do accept many claims that have never been proven to us. You you accept a great number of things you said in your like statement. What? What you, believe about? That, you believe that Mark couldn't read ancient Greek. You no one knows if that's true. You don't even know who Mark was. How do you know he couldn't uh, read ancient Greek? I, I don't think I said that. I thought I said John yeah. couldn't. No, no, you said, well, you might have meant John. You said Mark couldn't have written Mark. Well, I, I, if I misspoke, I, I, I certainly meant John. But, but let me put it this way. I don't, uh, why do you think John didn't know ancient Greek? Well, because of the, the description of him only speaking Aramaic. It doesn't say that anywhere. There's no record of that. Um, I, I think that that's generally agreed upon by scholars. That, that no, it is not. What's generally that. agreed on by scholars is that Alexander the Great made Koine Greek the universal language of the empire about 300 years before Christ. And by the time of Christ, most people in the Mediterranean world knew Koine Greek, at least as a second language. Uh, not, and some of them, of course, as their first language. So that's, that's history. 
Now, what I think you're basing John's ignorance on. Okay, just just a second, because I asked a question. I asked a question. I asked a question that you you totally blew past, and that's what am I believing? Like, because you said you believe things. You're believing that. that. You're believing that John believe did. You, you're saying that John didn't know ancient Greek. You're believing that. Who told you that? And why do you believe it? The scholars that study the way that he was described in in the texts and the texts giving, surrounding no, they're the giving Bible. their opinion. They're giving their opinion, and you believe their. Yeah, opinion. I know many scholars. Well, it, in fact, almost all scholars until recent history, and probably most of them now, believe that John did write it in Greek. So, I mean, if you don't think so, that's fine. You don't have to believe it, but you are believing. I, you're believing what you were told, and you have no evidence of it. That's the point I'm making. And you, and everything you said is that way. You said that the Gospels are not written as history, they're written as myth. Really? Well, who told you that? Not the Gospel, okay. right? No. Yeah, so there's 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 a disparity uh, between the claims here. Well, hold on a second. There's a disparity between the claims here. Just like I said, if I have a pet dog, that's a very mundane claim. If I say I have a pet dragon, that's not a mundane claim. So you're trying to equivocate and make this false equivocation between the two things. If someone says, hey, I don't believe that somebody could write Aramaic, or they believe they can read Aramaic, or something along the lines. That's a very mundane claim. There's not a lot really there to go, well, you know, maybe he could, maybe he couldn't. My, my, it doesn't hinge upon that. Like, my beliefs don't hinge upon that. But you're sort of saying, hey, a guy came back from the dead. You're going to need more evidence because it is such, a, well, actually, it's about 11 people, I think, is where you put your your finger on, on the people that came back from the dead that day. You've 10 no, people is many no, um well uh, whatever but that is an incredible claim that people came back from the dead three days or i mean i don't even know how long that the saints had been dead when they rose from their graves so maybe they overcame 100 years death i have no idea um uh, well th that's not a mundane claim you can't put that in the same realm as you know something like Alexander the Great existed, or Alexander the Great, you know, did this or that. Unless, of course, you're saying Alexander the Great did miracles, and then you have something that is not just a mundane. Then, then you have to have a much more um, grandiose claim that you've got to support. Well, let me just take your example of you saying that you have a pet dragon. Um, I, I would have to say I doubt it, obviously, unless there were some other factors. One is if people around the world throughout history have often claimed that there are dragons and they've had contact with dragons. Uh, right, even, that's just your belief. That's just no, your no, belief. No, no, I'm saying, no, I'm saying if I've heard many uh, stories about people who've, uh, who've, had dra who've seen dragons, and then let's just say uh, somebody I knew or that I had no reason to doubt gave a very honest testimony. Let's say several people did. That they had been over to your house and and you do have a dragon in fact and i and uh you know and, and then I you'd believe it what's that then you'd believe it well i wouldn't disbelieve it by default because no no I, well, hold on a second hold on a second you're, you're sort of saying hey if there are stories of dragons from around the world which there are some stories sure and a few people said yeah mark's definitely got a dragon you would believe it no, I wouldn't necessarily believe it, but I would not. Why discount. not? Why not? I've got testimonial evidence. I've got, you know, if they wrote it down, would that be more believable for you? I, I guess I would remain undecided because I can't think of how it would impact my life. You yeah, see, but it's funny. You won't remain undecided about this. You're you're absolutely convinced that this did occur, which is yeah. weird because so the, the problem is um, intellectual consistency. You hear... Um, stories from other religions immediately discount, but this one you give credence to and, and sort of all of the problems surrounding it, you'll, you'll brush away and overcome it um, because um, it, it is your religion. And it's, it's interesting in the opening that you sort of said, well, I have an ideology, which I mean, I suppose roughly I, secular humanism is an ideology, but I'm, I'm not in a religion. I don't, it doesn't really matter to me whether Jesus rose from the dead or didn't rise from the dead. It just, you know, I, I don't believe it because there's no evidence for it. Well, uh, Christianity, uh, we could say, is a faith that I have, to be sure. I'm not a religious person. I don't belong to any sure, religion. Sure. But um, 
I'm just a, I mean, when I was younger, I was in a religious system and I uh, abandoned it. And uh, instead, I just went looking for the truth. And I've, I've studied, you know, the evidence that convinces me that Jesus uh, is historically true and that the, uh, his resurrection is uh, the only uh, sensible answer to the question that I raised earlier is how did these things, why do these things exist as they do? Uh, every other suggestion, and, there, and many can be made, doesn't have any evidence either, but this has some. This has some evidence because we know that the people, well, you might say we don't know this, but we have historical records that we have no reason to doubt, that the people who were with him and followed him and say they saw him raised from the dead, that they that they died for their testimony and that they were competent to answer whether that happened or not because they saw him afterwards and so forth. We also have no uh, explanation other than the resurrection that makes sense for the tomb being empty, frankly. I mean, uh, well, yeah, but that's not that's not how skepticism works. So you sort of said, well, I'm a skeptic. The skeptic basically doesn't believe a claim until there's sufficient evidence based upon how grandiose the claim is, as I explained earlier. But like you wouldn't believe me even. And and um, I, I remember a, a good friend of mine, Ember, sort of talking about a guy that lived in India called Sai Baba. And, um, you know, sort of died about, I think, the mid 80s from memory. He was a contemporary to us. And right, there are did. people that believe that he did miracles, that he um, overcame death, he rose from the dead. And they will testify that today, but you still wouldn't believe them, even though you can meet these people and they will tell you that Sai Baba did all of these things, that he I was the incarnation. I would not immediately doubt it. I would not immediately doubt it. I believe that supernatural things happen both inside and outside of the Christian faith. So uh, I'm not, I don't rule out the supernatural uh, by, you know, just by default, uh, which is something I think maybe you are more inclined to do. I'm not. I, uh, I believe there's too many people that I've known uh, who have experienced things that appear to be supernatural. And I, there's like not a, uh, a woman I knew uh, named Jane in Santa Cruz, California, had cancer throughout her body. Uh, she, her doctors gave her up. It was inoperable. It was. Uh, it was uh, so it cashed and went into remission, and that's supernatural. Well, by prayer, as a result of prayer, she did. How do you be, know it was the prayer? Well, it might not have been, but it happened to correspond to the true course. Was she getting? Not, not, was she getting treatment as well? No, no. She had actually resigned herself to die. She, in fact, okay. she's well. She actually. I think that the, didn't want I think to be this prayed. is really dangerous territory because i would sort of suggest people listen to their doctors instead of you know resorting to prayer uh, and medicine. you asked me for an example i don't i did yeah not, yeah no i know i just it, I, I, I apologize it. it's just Mary. gone into very dangerous yeah. territory when you start okay. suggesting that people i also know that for cancer. the last time i saw her was five years after her being healed and she still was cancer free that you know maybe mm -hmm. that's not a miracle but it, it and correspondence does not prove causation but it's uh, this is the kind of thing I've seen many things like that uh, that are either very coincidental or they are what they appear to be. You know, they appear to be answers to prayer. Uh, the fact that people throughout history and throughout all the world until very recently have believed that there is something beyond the natural world, which sometimes manifests itself in some way or another in this world, uh, means that yeah. that is the default. Well, position of humanity I'll just, I'll just put out i'll just put out steve you are not a skeptic a skeptic will believe something when the evidence is there to suggest it you're basically saying well i don't have a better explanation this is going to be the explanation that i've used and I've, I've heard this all throughout the debate you're basically saying hey that's the best explanation i've got therefore i will believe it and i don't that is not a skeptic's approach a skeptic will say hey i will reserve my belief and I, I will not believe it until it actually has been proven to be true beyond a reasonable doubt, basically. Well, so very little, I, very little can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. I would at least hold out for good evidence. Really? You don't think you don't think that the fact that we're sitting here talking can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, it depends on your worldview. There are people who have what a worldview. Well, a worldview is the assumption you make about reality before you even yeah, look at no, it. I know what a worldview is, but okay. what would you so, say that there's no wait, good evidence worldview? that we're talking about? Okay. Well, I was are, answering your question. Are, are you about. saying there's no good evidence for us talking right now? It depends on how the evidence is interpreted. If you believe 
that everything that exists is an illusion, as Hindus teach, then this might be an illusion too. It might, if, if someone thinks everything in reality is a dream of the gods, well, how could we prove them wrong? We can't prove them wrong. Okay, if so that, hang on, that's lie. called radical skepticism. It's basically disbelieving everything, no matter the evidence that you have. So the fact that we have our senses and our senses are mostly accurate, um, I do, they can be fooled, but they are pretty well accurate. If you want to deny that your senses are real, well, good luck to you. But my question would be, why are you talking to us? Why are you talking to me? Um, I don't, I don't take that view. I don't take that view. Why, said, why bring it up then? Okay. Well, you asked, you said, you think well that you're in the position no, you're in the position now all right just to, well let's let's just, just to be not, sure that like just the question once in a while yeah uh, you asked me a question i said uh you you asked me is do you think that we are talking to each other is a fact that's beyond reasonable doubt i said yeah. that depends on the worldview by my worldview it's beyond reasonable doubt yes i believe i believe my eyes i believe my ears so i i have no problem with it there are people who have a different worldview, and and to them, there is reasonable doubt in their minds. So what we dis, what we consider reasonable doubt is dependent on our worldview. Now, what about the miraculous? I believe you you said you're a humanist, a secular humanist. So, sure. so you don't believe there's supernatural, I suppose. Okay, so of course, uh, you know, miracles don't happen. Uh, in well, your can world. I answer that? Can I can I explain it, or are you just can tell me what my belief is? I thought I was repeating what you said, but go ahead. No, no, no. So secular humanism basically will rely on science. I don't say, hey, there's nothing supernatural. I know that for sure. But really, I don't believe in anything supernatural until it's been demonstrated. I have enough evidence for it. And these sort of stories about people that had these things that, you know, for some reason aren't medically documented or, you know, are, are kind of wishy-washy on what has actually happened, that they're not very good evidence. And a try as we might, and we really have tried to find anything supernatural, people can't seem to present it. And, and so why should I believe something when you can't show any evidence for it? What do you mean that they can't present? There are, there are documents, there are histories, there are ancient and modern uh, biographies, things that, that testify to lots of things that would be best understood as supernatural. Sure. Uh, sure. Okay. So so why do you say there's no evidence of it? Well, I mean, the, the evidence isn't near. Like, are you, do you realize, like, we can, we look at those documents and they come from all different places. Like, um, Islam says that Muhammad split up the, the moon in two kind of thing. All these, these claims. And you're basically saying, well, we've got these documents of it. Then why don't we believe it? Well, how do we see if the documents are actually true about what they claim or not true and are simply mythology, like we all understand, you know, the, the Norse gods to be or the, the Greek gods to be? How do we check that? Well, in many cases, we can't, just like we can't check any non-supernatural events of the past. Uh, I mean, we can't, we can't prove that George Washington was the first president, except from documents that people wrote. If if there if no documents existed and it hadn't been passed down, we'd have no idea. That can't be proven from science. That can't be proven from you know with a Geiger counter or with a litmus paper. Did George Washington live? Of course not. They, we everything we know about any historical event before you and I were born, we know because of testimony. Testimony of people who allegedly saw those things or knew them. We can reject their testimony. I'm not saying that all testimony is equally valid no fool would believe that. I'm just saying that you can't rule out testimony simply because it contains elements that don't fit into your worldview. Uh, yeah, and, and it's fine. It's fine. If you want to say that a president existed, I'm fine with that. There's not a problem. Like, I, it doesn't really make an impact on my life. But if you're saying that this magical guy appeared that conquered death, well, you're going to have to do better than just somebody from... 2000 years ago claiming it to be so well you you know when i mentioned jane and her uh, cure from cancer i did that because you asked me for an example of something yes. I'd, that gives me support to the view that yes. god prayer, okay but you don't know that was a supernatural event you can't tell you just oh. have faith that was a supernatural event well, because i, I it am coincided persuaded. with the, the prayer and this this event happening now i don't doubt something happened but how do we actually figure out whether that was a supernatural event or not? 
We may not be able to, but there are many things that appear to be supernatural that would be expected in my worldview that I have experienced, and therefore I have no reason to doubt them. In fact, I believe them completely. Uh, I don't believe every claim that people make of supernatural things, of course, but I do have some experience. Now, I don't expect you to believe my experience because you just said, you know, just because someone says something happened doesn't mean it. Right, right. I don't, I, I'm not saying this in order to convince you that that this was supernatural. No, no, I know, I know. I, I just wanted to know where your bar was. Reasons. I'm saying I have my yeah, reasons. Yeah. And they're not irrational. You know? Yeah, so I just I just wanted to know where your bar was for saying, okay, you, you say these things are supernatural. How do you evaluate what is supernatural as opposed to like a coincidence or a, a very rare thing happening that would happen, you know, very, very improbably? Um, and it seems that your bar is basically non-existent. You, you just, if you see it as a miracle, you can't check it, you can't investigate it, you can't actually see if it's a miracle. You just say, hey, that's supernatural and believe it without and this is what a skeptic would do they would say okay what is the evidence i have how do i investigate whether this event was supernatural or whether it was just a coincidence or a story from somebody else and it doesn't seem like you've got any criteria for showing what is supernatural as opposed to a huge coincidence well true but i'm sure you've ordered from amazon before i have or from ebay sure. okay so uh, i've never met anybody who works at Amazon or eBay, and yet I bought things from them. And what happens is they promise that if I send them this payment, they will send me this product. I've done this very many times, and invariably it's always happened. Now, I don't know who those people are, but you couldn't convince me that those products coming to me was unrelated to my having sent the payment. I believe that if, if I pray, and something happens that's inexplicable, and it happens numerous times, maybe hundreds of times in my life. Uh, you know, I don't think I, I'm irrational in thinking, okay, there's a relationship between the request and the product, or as it were. Uh, you know, do you pray a lot? Do you pray a lot? Yeah. Are your prayers not answered? Do you pray and nothing, nothing comes about? Well, the Bible doesn't say all prayers will be answered. I, I believe in the no, Bible. no, no, no. It's it's a question. Do, no, do you pray prayer. and nothing oh, happens? There are prayers that I've had that did not happen. Okay, but... so basically, no, but hold on a second, because you've brought up this Amazon thing. It would be like me sending money to Amazon. Sometimes I get the product, sometimes I don't, and I decide they're correlated because the times where I send the money, eventually a product will come to me. That That is what you are doing. Well, it's a little it's different. Called, it's me... it's called the, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. It's you're only counting the hits and ignoring the misses. Okay, but let's go back to the Amazon thing. If Amazon okay. wasn't promising to send the products, but uh, but they but they said that there will be times when they see fit that they will send a product if you send a payment. Well, that's a strange. Why business. would you send a payment then? Yeah, why yeah, would you send a payment? Most people would not. Most people would not, of course. Yeah, unless you no, really, of unless you really, unless getting that the would, product. That would be a fool's errand, really. It's just up to their. Yeah, whim, but, whether you actually get what you want or, or not so right. that's when i make point why, when why I make, pray if they're basically saying you know we're not like you're, sometimes it'll like you're looking for an explanation of my thinking but you don't want me to hear it don't you don't want to hear it okay, oh, okay. what i would say is this it'd be a very bizarre business model to be sure but if mm -hmm. under those circumstances i did send money and i did get the product i ordered uh i would say there's a correlation there I might say I'm not sure why uh, these other times I didn't get a product, but I'm not going to say this is a coincidence that I got the very thing I ordered for the exact price I paid. Uh, okay, there's when it comes to prayer, it's far more complex than most people think. So because, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Do, do you think good things happen to you and you don't even pray for them? Yes. Yeah, the Bible says God knows what we have need for before we ask. Okay, so... The, the, the more apt analogy is that you get things from Amazon, sometimes out of the blue with no, no input from you. Sometimes things just come and sometimes you order them and the thing that you want comes. And you're basically going through life saying, well, that means that, that this, this company, the ordering of it is what's causing it. When in reality, good things come even when you don't order it. So it is not the order that is making the things come because things are coming anyway. 
The difference with prayer is that prayer is a, re is a relationship between a child and a father, not a business. So let's change the analogy just this much. That the, person, the, person the analogy is sort of nonsensical at this point. Okay, so let's make it not nonsensical. Let's change the analogy that my dad is overseas and I don't see him personally, but I, he sends me money from time to time, okay? Uh, he makes sure I'm taken care of, but there's something special I'd like that he isn't sending me without being asked. And so I, I send a request for it and he does, mm -hmm. okay? Now that would- Or not. Huh? Or not. Or not, exactly. And, and if he does not, I would assume that he's either, uh, he has his reasons. Maybe he doesn't have the money. Maybe he doesn't think it's a good expense. I, I leave that with him since he's the donor. I'm not the one who gets to make the, the, the demands. If yeah, I, so he just doesn't doesn't respond to you, doesn't send anything, just ignores you completely. Well, he never ignores me completely because he still uh -huh. support. But the point is, if he doesn't answer a special request of mine, I can assume either that he doesn't care for me or that he has a good reason for not doing it. And if I know my father be a good man and a caring father who generally takes care of me very well, I would probably say, yeah, he must have a good reason not to do it in this case. Uh, there's no promise that everything I ask will be given to me, but it doesn't mean that asking will never get results. And that when, the, when asking does get results, that that doesn't confirm that he answered my request. Yeah, so it, it's the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, which is basically when you're doing something, you count all the hits and you ignore all the misses and say it's being caused by this thing. Um, it, it's a very, um, we, we've gone way off topic actually, um, James. Okay. I, I do apologize, mate. It's probably my fault, usually is. Um, um, but yeah, we probably should get back on topic. Or how, how long did you want to go for? We actually, I just remember, so we have only two hours. I want to be sure I get you guys out of here at a decent time. So we actually probably should jump into the Q&A right now. Yeah, okay, we're going to move yeah, through okay. these as fast as we can, folks. Thank you very much. And with that, Oliver Catwell says both. If an omnipotent being not limited to Christ gives definitive proof of existence, does this enslave people to recognition of this being as God, quote unquote, with a lowercase g? They may, I think they mean kind of like just creator, thus mm -hmm. limiting freedom of choice slash opinion. What are your guys' thoughts? I would like to answer. I think it may be addressed to... Mark, do you want to answer it or do you want me to? I'll be glad to. Oh, you can go. Go for it. I'm, I'm not okay. fussed yet. Yeah. It. it sounds to me like the question may be coming from a Christian uh, who's saying, even if there is a God such as Christians believe in, he might not give uh, unmistakable proof of it because that would eliminate our being able to make a choice to believe or not. And if, if believing is something he values, if trusting him is something he values, he might prefer for us to make a choice to believe without you know the evidence being overwhelming um if that's true I, I think that may be where the question is coming from but i'm not positive um i would say that even if god does show proof of himself it doesn't overwhelm free will because you know the miracles of jesus in my opinion were done publicly and many people who saw them believed and many who saw them did not they chose not to believe when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, many people believed in Jesus, but some didn't, and they went and told the Pharisees about it, and, and they they you know plotted to kill Jesus and Lazarus. Uh, they didn't doubt that Lazarus had risen from the dead. They just didn't like the implications, and they didn't want to live with them. So um, I would say that God can still make himself known without forcing us to believe, because even once in the Bible, it says that God spoke from heaven to Jesus when he was with a crowd uh, with an audible voice. And it says, some said it thundered, and others said an angel spoke to him. So some recognized the words and thought it was an angel. Others just, you know, naturalists, you know, they said, no, it's a natural thing. It thundered. So even if God speaks directly from heaven, a person who wishes to be an unbeliever has the option of saying, ah, no, that was a coincidence. Uh, mm -hmm. I've sometimes asked atheists, you know, what, what would it take to prove to you that there's a God? Usually they say something like, well, if he just, you know, write his name across the sky, I'd believe it. I don't think he, they would. I think they'd find some natural explanation for that. Uh, you know, they'd say, uh, it, well, if he appeared right here before me right now, I'd believe him. Uh, it, I, most of them would not. Most of them would say, no, that's got to be a hallucination or that's some, um, a trick is being played on me. I don't want to rush he, you guys. So, so sorry. It's just that we have so many questions. I've got to 
if you're able to yeah. it, any last thought on that uh steve and then we got to kick it over to mark for him to respond as well i'll take it over to mark now i'll let mark have it all right so if god had that unmistakable proof for himself and you presume that he would want to because he wants people to believe essentially um there has been people he has given this unmistakable proof to like saul on damascus road kind of thing um and it did not seem to impact their free will they chose freely to follow him um uh, 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 well the, the uh, satan apparently knows that god exists knows his om omnis omnipotent power um and um doesn't follow him so I, I see no reason why humans wouldn't have a choice whether they do want to worship this being or not even if they do know that he exists um the, the better question is why doesn't an omnipotent god who can do it would be trivial to let everybody know he exists and wants them to know he exists do this because he's done it for other people and it would be absolutely trivial for him uh, either he doesn't want people to be confident that he exists or um he doesn't have the power to appear to people to convince them well, there's you a got third it. option but i use my time up yeah Trinity Radio, thanks so much, says, greetings all. So glad to see Steve Gregg on Modern Day Debate again. That's right, second time here, Steve. My first time hosting you myself. It's been a pleasure to host both of you, Steve and Mark. It's been such a good conversation. I didn't, it was like the q and I wanted, but anyway, uh, thanks for your support, Trinity. And Bond says, Mark, the United States of America is actually a 2,000-year-old empire. These stories about it starting in 1776 are just myth made up to justify a made-up constitution. We have, all we have is hearsay, not evidence. Obviously, I think they're kind yeah. of... Wrong. Yeah, I think, I think sort of the evidence from, you know, uh, the sort of colonial America and say, um, you know, ancient Egypt, for instance, are, are not on, on par. I think there's a discrepancy in the sort of, you know, recording and the uh, methods used to record history there. So um yeah i i know but i believe you i believe you yeah two thousand year old us easter from mantle says if a collection of documents is extremely contradictory what is your methodology of determining the truth of it steve well if they're extremely contradictory i'm not sure we could determine what's the truth that's the point the gospels are not extremely contradictory that's the point i've been making there are small uh differences in details that don't make any difference to the credibility of the story uh it's it's as if you know any three people who tell the same story that they they witnessed will give different details and some of them might even get some of them wrong but they wouldn't get the main story wrong uh and so you know you're right i mean if a lot of documents are extremely contradictory there'd probably be no way to to know which is true unless we had some external verification from independent documents but we you know in the case of the gospels the main evidence we have for everything Jesus did is in the Gospels, but they're not contradictory. Now, they do have a lot of things different about them. Uh, I've spent many years and, and many hours on my website, if you want to listen to my lectures, listen to the alleged contradictions in the Bible. And uh, frankly, my position is a contradiction does not exist unless there are two statements that cannot both be true. And there's very few of those between the Gospels. I'm not sure there's any, but if there are this any, they're one. very few. Go ahead. Go ahead. This one from Even Lord says, a question for, let's say, they said, for both debaters, do you think Christianity is the best ideology in world history? I'll let Mark go first. Obviously, I do. Yeah, I, yeah, I, sure. Uh, well, no, if you're able I, to I be extra think... pithy, guys, sorry, I just have so many questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so there's better ideologies, especially the ones coming out lately. Obviously, I, I'm a follower of secular humanism, but I think that religious humanism, as well as normal humanism, is better ideology than straight out Christianity. Um, theistic humanism does exist in Christianity, but it's that that I like about it. Um, the problem with Christianity, like all religious ideologies, is it cannot project into the future. Is it good to do asteroid mining? Is it good to do cloning? Is it good to do um, skin cell replication? We don't know the, because that cannot provide any kind of um, um, interpretation that can possibly help us with these things. So I think that it was the best at the time. We can do better. Well, the examples you just gave would not be answered by any religious view or, or worldview. Uh, those are things that we decided case by case by scientific people and many science are Christians. There's nothing about Christianity that would prevent them from coming to the same conclusions as a secularist on some of those points. 
this one come ing from the batman says mark you claimed bible cannot be evidence they say does written testimony of women claiming a man abused them count in court as evidence yeah so uh, so evidence it is some form of evidence it is um testimony which is sort of um taken as not as strong as physical evidence like if you go to court the mo the best evidence you will get is things like dna evidence like physical evidence that's been gathered with scientific methodology it is considered a form of evidence but it will never stand on its own especially if that evidence is somebody claiming somebody said something that's hearsay not allowed in court for a very good reason and just to mention it spectral evidence isn't allowed in court which is magic and miracles and all of these kinds of things not allowed in court either this one coming in from lil drill music says one thing about christians we admit we are skeptical of our own sources it's hard to tell if this is meant to be sincere or if they're if it's some sort of satire but thank you for that. Folks, I want to remind you in the live chat, we were going to try to one more question or two. Uh, do want to remind you, attack the argument instead of the person. It's been a little bit salty tonight in the live chat. So I uh, want to encourage you, attack the arguments instead of the person. And that's, like I said, only about 1% being salty. So Are they Ember picking on says, me again? Um, huh? Are they picking on me again? Not quite. This see, Ember says, how many women went to Jesus's tomb, Steve? We don't know the total number. One of the Gospels names four of them and says, and other women besides them. So uh, there's an unknown number that went. There were quite a few. Now, uh, some of the Gospels mention one or two of them uh, initially, uh, but they are also found in the lists of the of the other women that are mentioned. Uh, the the uh, stories of the discovery of the tomb of Jesus uh, in the four Gospels uh, need to be harmonized, and there are many people who say they can't be, but that's not true. I, I, they can be harmonized. You can you can see, for example, when Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, John records her coming alone, but but the other Gospels say that she was with the other women when they first showed up earlier, but the other women ran away to tell the disciples when they saw the tomb was open. Mary didn't. Uh, and so she got there and saw the angels where the others had not immediately done so. They did later. There's to harmonize the the, the uh, gospels, just like any you know three or four or five or ten uh, historical records about the same event. Uh, you, harmonizing them is is probably the best way to get to the uh, you know the bottom of it. And if you don't have enough uh, ability to harmonize them, you can live with uncertainty as to which what was the order of events here, how, how these are harmonized. But only if they could not be harmonious would there be a problem. And that is not the case with the resurrection appearances. This one coming in from, we're going to squeeze this last one in if you guys are okay with it. How to rule an asteroid says, question for Steve, is there testimony you would take in the modern day that would convince you that anything else besides Christianity in terms of supernatural anything else exists? Besi I believe lots of things besides Christianity exist in the supernatural. I believe the devil and demons, I believe, are there, and, and they are the basis for many other religions that are not Christian. Uh, I, you know, one would have, if, if you mean, is there, what evidence would it take to convince me that there are other supernatural faiths that are not Christianity, which, which themselves render Christianity untrue? I guess what would have to be proven to me is that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, or uh, or at least that the people who uh, recorded it were uh, can be shown to be dishonest people or people who were incompetent to record it. Uh, we we don't believe everything we read, but we don't disbelieve everything we read, even very strange stories, unless we know that the reporter is either has has an agenda that's that would make him compromise the truth, or else doesn't know the truth because they're incompetent and they're they're talking about what they don't know about. These are the the tests I would apply to reading any historical or newspaper or watching a news broadcast. If if the persons reporting don't know what they're talking about, well, of course, that raises questions about whether I should believe them. If I can see that they're slanting the story for some kind of agenda, that also raises questions about their credibility. But until I see one of those two things, I typically, especially if something's put out there for 
public consumption and for peer review, I, I tend to think, okay, uh, they're probably telling the truth unless we find some reason to not think so. I don't generally accuse people of being liars if I've got no evidence against them uh, that they're liars. You got it. With that, I want to say, folks, both of our guests are linked in the description. If you have not checked out their links, what are you waiting for? Even if you disagree with someone, there's so much value with reading, you could say, the primary sources, going directly to their sources, understanding it because you yourself read it. Highly encourage you. You can check out our guest links below, and that way you truly understand what it is that they are saying for sure. I want to say thank you very much for our guests, Steve and Mark. It's been a true pleasure to have you guys. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, thank you Mark. Uh, yeah, thanks, James. Thanks, Steve. Good talking with you. With that, I'll be back in just a moment with a super short post-credit scene. Stick around, folks, and I'll be back in just a moment. Switching.